So, hello everyone and welcome to what is about to feel like school for the next few minutes. If you expected to be able to sit back and relax during this final talk of the day, well I'm sorry because you have been grossly misled. Because we are about to have a very small but very important competition. In the next few minutes, I'm going to ask everyone on the call one question. And I'm going to split everyone on the call into two teams. These will be known as the odd and the even team. If your age is an odd number, then you are on the odd team. And if it's even, you guessed it, you are on the even team. Now, for this question, I'm going to allow the even team to use your, use your laptops or mobile devices as tools to help you get the answers. For the odd team, well, you drew the short straw. You can only rely on sheer brain power. Now, when you know the answer, if you could please message it into the chat, followed by your team name. That bit's important because the first correct answer that I see, that team are the winners. So now that, that is all explained, let's get to the question. According to Wikipedia, what was the population of Norway in 2019? According to Wikipedia, what was the population of Norway in 2019? So we've got a good few guesses coming through, some uh, ambitious efforts. We have uh, 5,000, we have 16.2, a million, and there we have the right answer approximately 5.3 million and that was from the even team which means the even team are our winners so who could have predicted that well me clearly when i created this powerpoint maybe we should take a step back here does this feel fair how can we honestly expect the odd team to keep up with the even when they were at such a disadvantage what the odd team has just experienced is known as the digital debate. They were never going to be able to keep up with the even team. And why should you be expected to? You were never given the tools, the access to the tools that gave the even team such an advantage. Unfortunately, this is what members of society experience every day. The question that I asked might have seemed like just a random, a random pub trivia question but the answer had a much more significant meaning. Approximately 5.3 million people was the answer. And that is the amount of people in the UK last year had either not used the internet in the last three months or ever in their lifetime. 5.3 million people. Now, before I go any further, I want to stress that the digital world we find ourselves in is an amazing realm of opportunity. But our dual citizenship between the physical and the digital world is not shared by everyone. This digital divide is much like boarding a train in the London Underground, actually. Who gets an immediate feeling of panic upon seeing this photo? A pre-COVID world where it was weirdly normal to stand so close to strangers you could probably smell what they had for their lunch that day. I'm going to go uh, out on a limb here and suggest that absolutely nobody misses this. When we're in the underground, we're constantly reminded to mind the gap. For most of us, we never give this a second thought as we cross it each and every day. Once we cross that gap, we can go wherever we want. We can see history come to life before our very eyes at the National History Museum. Or we can taste the eclectic styles of food from all over the city. But this is all dependent on us being able to bridge that gap. This is a very easy task for us and one that we do every day. But for others, this, can feel very, this gap can feel very apparent and can seem insurmountable. We rarely pay much attention to this gap, but maybe it's about time we do. Now, there are many different groups in society who are impacted by the digital debate. There is one, however, that stands out to me because it's a group I would expect 
to be most involved in a post-digital world. And that demographic is teenagers. ONS data shows that 760,000 young people have reported having no internet access at home via a computer or a laptop. 760,000. That's more than the population of Manchester or Edinburgh. Or to put it into the context of a classroom, 25 pupils in size, that's three kids in every class on average that experience what the odd team just did every single day. Now, at the start of the talk, I split the teams based on the parity of your age. As you probably guessed, this was just a random way to split the call. I could have done this any number of ways. I could have split you into people who agree that pineapple should never go on pizza and monsters. But I thought I'd go for something a little less contentious. The digital divide doesn't do this. What it does instead though, is it differentiates by income. Research shows that those young people affected by the digital divide the hardest are also statistically the poorest. Less than 70% of families who earn between six to 10,000 pounds a year had direct access to the internet from their households. And this percentage skyrocketed all the way up to 98% for those earning 40,000 pounds a year or higher. The more I researched into this topic, the more it made me think of my hometown. I come from a place called Claybank, which is nestled on the western border of Glasgow. There it is. It's that area with all the red in it on the map. And uh, when you see something with that much red in it, you know it's never going to be a good thing. Clybank's postcodes sit in the top 20% of the most deprived areas in Scotland, with parts of the town also falling into the top 5%. From what I've spoken about so far, we can see that Clybank and many areas just like it all throughout the UK have much higher rates of digital disengagement than better off surrounding areas. For me, if I'm working in London or Glasgow city centre, it could be easy for me, someone who has no issue in bridging this divide, to think, you know what? Yeah, we are living in a post-digital world. But if I were to return to Clybank and ask the young people there the exact same question, can we honestly say that their answer would be yes? Now, it's important to mention that the digital divide also affects young people in more areas than just finances and education. The social lives of the young people have increased online dramatically in the last 10 years. They're no longer just a time in our lives where we pose for embarrassing photos that will follow us around and haunt us for years to come. Yep, that's right. That is a younger me wearing a belt to spell out my own name in fake diamonds. I don't remember what was cool at the time, but I know for a fact that it was definitely not this. Now, as embarrassing as these times can be for us, they're incredibly social times. We're constantly meeting new people and forming new relationships. But for those impacted by the digital divide, this often difficult period of life can feel a whole lot harder. Whether it's a party organised through Facebook or a school sports team WhatsApp chat, if you're offline as a team nowadays, you might as well be off the grid. You get forgotten about, left out, embarrassed when confronted by your peers why you can't join them online. You're one of the few people not invited to the biggest party on the planet. And you're reminded of that every single day. And the recent pandemic has only exacerbated all of these issues. I'm sure that everyone on the call right now has felt a time during lockdown where they felt physically cut off from the world. I know I have. Can you imagine what it would feel like to also be digitally cut off? For us, the exclusion is temporary, but for these young people, it's constant. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Significant advances can be made when proper action is put in place. Whether it's BT scheme to hand out 10,000 vouchers to families in need for internet access, or the, the government supplying laptops for schools for purer pupils. 
This is, this is a problem that has been acknowledged at the highest level. A problem which in a post-digital world should not exist at all. Now, I don't expect anyone to come off this call, walk outside and cure the world of the digital divide with the snap of their fingers. What I do expect though, is for everyone to do something that I know we can all do right now. And that is to mind the gap. Actually mind the gap. As a leader in IT services, it's hard to shake the feeling that Atos has a responsibility to play in helping bridge this divide. What if whenever we ordered X amount of laptops, we donated one to a family in need? Or if we extended our mentorship programs to those out with the company facing the divide? What if we chose today to back an initiative that would help lead us into a post-digital world? We're here today to discuss if we're living post-digitally. And for many of us, it might be easy to say that we are. But our perspective is not the only one that matters here. Look, does this make us bad people by getting excited about the thought of living in a post-digital world? No. One of the best things about the tech industry is that it always has one eye on the future. But when we trade off those on the other side of this divide for progress, we put our own models into question. If we decide today that we are living in a post-digital world, then we accept that we are on a train, leaving the platform and leaving those who couldn't bridge the gap behind. Maybe it's about time we held open the doors, lay out a helping hand and made sure that everyone got on board. Thank you for listening.